Ralph here once again, and we have a lot of information to go through, so I'm going to give you a little bit of preview throughout the entire segment tonight. We are going to cover vitamin C. We're going to cover an arthritis drug, which seems to do a miraculous job in increasing survivability of individuals with severe or moderate coronavirus um, uh, symptoms. We are going to cover basically the difficulty in detecting coronavirus, like temperature checks and things like that are not going to cut it. We are also going to look at the potential for endemics or massive like influenza outbreaks in response to, believe it or not, the COVID-19 pandemic mitigation strategies, as well as vaccine challenges and sad and hopefully does not come to be the potential for coronavirus to infect pets and then transport it back to humans, i.e. in the case of what we're seeing with minks this recently in other parts of the world. But let's proceed as follows. Vitamin C's effectiveness against COVID may hinge on that vitamin's natural transport levels. Right, before I proceed, think of it this way. Let's say you rarely drink milk or you haven't drank milk for like two or three years. Then all of a sudden you start to have a glass of milk or start drinking, let's say, half a gallon of milk. As opposed to the individual who's been drinking milk on a regular basis, they may have developed more of the enzymes, such as lactase, to break that milk down and digest it effectively. Correlate that with vitamin C. So all of a sudden you take like a half a gallon of milk if they're not drinking milk for many years, you may run into stomach issues, so to say, or digestion issues. Well, kind of like vitamin C. If your body doesn't see a nutrient coming in, why would it develop the enzymes or the transporters necessary to transport large amounts of that nutrient if it's not there? The body conserves resources. Well, I hope you get the point on that, but let us proceed as follows. This research here, also too, I'm going to cover more on Tuesday, most likely this week, is a tremendous compendium of the benefits of vitamin C in reference to a myriad of ailments, which is definitely worthy of delving into. And it really, really, really makes you look at vitamin C in a whole new uh, light, amazingly so. But to proceed, in fact, part of the paradox of concern with COVID-19 is that most at risk mostly have lower levels of vitamin C before they get sick and fewer transporters, as we discussed, like the enzymes that break down milk if they're not drinking it for many years, to enable the vitamin to be a benefit if they get more. Many of those most at risk of COVID-19 include individuals who are older, black male with chronic medical conditions like osteoarthritis, interesting, as we're next article is going to be on arthritis, hypertension and diabetes to have lower levels of vitamin C. Another reason vitamin C therapy would be considered a reasonable treatment. The investigators also note that patients may develop a vitamin C deficiency over the course of COVID-19 illness since during an active infection, vitamin C is consumed at a more rapid rate. Insufficient levels can augment the damage done by an overzealous immune response. Now, as we proceed forward in more and more discoveries in reference to coronavirus or COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, it is becoming painfully evident that malnutrition, for example, deficiencies in zinc, C, D, selenium, so on and so forth, increase an individual's susceptibility to succumb to COVID-19. So you can have plenty of food and still be malnourished, especially in an industrialized society, which to find that many individuals, even in this study, are pretty deficient in vitamin C. Now think about it. The body consumes zinc at faster levels uh, in reference to COVID-19. And what is one of the side effects of COVID-19 or one of the symptoms, I should say? Lack of smell, lack of taste. I'm still waiting for a medical professional to catch that clue where basically if a person has diminished taste or smell and zinc is partly responsible in helping the individual overcome COVID-19 as well as C, as well as D, as well as melatonin, which we covered this last week. Uh, yeah. Malnutrition, malnourishment, or increased demand for certain nutrients definitely play a role. And with the next one in play, our arthritis drug. Now, initially, I see a prescription drug, I blew it off. But however, though, I retook, I should say, took a second look at this. And bricitinib, bricitinib, an arthritis drug in this small study, 
appear to have some quite amazing, amazing effects. So let's get a little larger here and look at this. In the study of the patients who were in multiple hospitals across Italy and Spain had a 71% reduced risk of dying compared to patients who had not taken the drug. Now keep in mind, it's still a small study. The median age is 81, but still, regardless of that, now with vitamin C and zinc and selenium, D, melatonin, so on and so forth, and all the other beneficial, wonderful things that help overcome COVID-19 or prevent, potentially prevent infection, are all there but this one in the cases of individuals with uh, severe um, COVID-19 so to say or severe COVID-19 infection that is a worthy of note albeit a prescription drug and I know a lot of us are averse to prescription drugs still that is amazing remember we also covered aspirin too being a benefit too so whatever helps an individual get over the COVID-19 Whatever helps us get past this one dark um, time in our history, let's just get it done. But to proceed as follows to the next one in play, let's back this up. And can we get, yep, here we go. Major concern here. Large late outbreaks of endemic disease possible following COVID-19 controls. Now keep in mind, look at this one word here. It's called NPI, non-pharmaceutical interventions, such as mask wearing, social distancing, so on and so forth. Now, here we go, the potential outcome. They found that even relatively short periods of NPI measures could lead to large future respiratory virus infections or outbreaks. These outbreaks are often delayed following the end of an NPI period. Now remember, but the researchers here are looking at observational studies in reference to other times when there's been masks and distancing and so on and so forth. And this is what they noticed. With peak cases projected to occur in many locations in the winter of 2021 to 2022, quote, it is very important to prepare for the possible future outbreak risk and pay attention to the full gamut of infections impacted by the COVID-19 MPIs. So think of it this way especially with children in school, even though the coronavirus or COVID-19 or whatever doesn't have much impact on the youth. Now, what we're doing in reference to the lockdowns, distancing, and masks, influenza or the respiratory viruses, especially in children and so on and so forth, do have a major impact on the youth. So you get where I'm heading you have to look at exactly what we're doing it may not be advantageous to other groups in the future as opposed to for example boosting the nutrients up having people take vitamin d c selenium zinc let's put it this way if you can control what you put over my mouth i should be able to control what you put in your mouth sounds kind of harsh i know but think about it uh Nutrient boosting to a society would have probably a greater impact due to all the correlations, the possibly causative effect, uh, than basically working with dark eight. I mean, seriously, we did this in the 1400s, uh, and this is the best we can come up with. No, science has come up with much better, just that bureaucrats haven't been paying much attention. And there is my rant on that. Let's go to the next one. Ba -ba -ba. All right, again, it's about 2.19 in the morning, so please forgive the slurring of the speech. Important one right here, because a lot of times they're recommending doing temperature checks and things along those lines, but exactly how effective can that be? So basically, the researchers showed with a two-week supervised quarantine of marine recruits, showed that few infected recruits had symptoms before diagnosis of SARS-CoV-2 infection. The transmission occurred despite implementing many best practice public health measures and that diagnoses were made only by scheduled tests, not by tests performed in response to symptoms. What does that mean? Let us proceed. 
The study data revealed asymptomatic spread of the virus, even under strict military orders for quarantine and public health measures, that most likely experienced better compliance than will be possible in other youth settings like college campuses. The researchers noted that daily temperature and symptom checks did not detect infections among the recruits, and that the virus is largely transmitted within a golden platoon where trainees tend to be near one another. So you see a lot of restaurants and things like that doing the temperature checks and symptom checks so on and so forth. Well, if most of your people are asymptomatic, think about it. All right, now we go to the next one. Let me back up here. And the next one is doo -doo -doo, transmission of SARS-CoV-2 on mink farms. This is important for one main aspect. Now, obviously, you're seeing currently, I think they've been uh, culling uh, minks because they found out that minks can transmit the virus to humans and humans can transmit the virus to minks. This is my concern if we keep on heading down this road where we're kind of like chasing our own tail is people's pets because pets are real important and they're a sign of comfort for a lot of individuals these days. And this is where I don't want to see it head. But be aware if we don't end this soon. Similar to SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2 binds to the host antiogenesis and converting enzyme, ACE2, we all heard that. Uh, the dub, ACE2 similarities in a range of different animals have been used as models. Experimental infections in dogs, cats, ferrets, hamsters, rhesus macaques, true shrews, da 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 But let's go back to the main thing. Experimentally infected cats, true shrews, hamsters, and ferrets could also transmit the virus. So they've been little rumblings about this now they're calling animals in response to it uh cats and dogs could be a potential vector let's just hope we don't go there all right after that we're going to go to a vaccine warning not really a warning it's just a sign of caution but i want to show you exactly what can go wrong with vaccines which uh i'm surprised a lot of the anti-vaxxers have not caught on to as well as the vaccine proponents. But I want to show you some interesting trivia that you probably haven't seen anyplace else. Well, I'll show you tonight. All right, here we go. Could SARS-CoV-2 evolve resistance to COVID-19 vaccines? And here is the warning. It's not really chilling, but they're just saying, hey, you know, watch it. And this has happened. But again, certain things like measles and mumps, there wasn't a resistance that was developed to the vaccine over time. But however, there could be mutations, but still. The researchers were also recommending nails, da, 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 consider proxy. They noted that strongly suppressing virus transmission through vaccinated hosts is key to slowing the evolution of resistance. Since it minimizes the opportunities for mutations to arise and reduces opportunities for natural selection to act on those mutations that do arise. What are the researchers saying? Well, the best thing I could do is show you an example. And example one, you may be quite surprised. And it has to do with the polio vaccine. Now, this is an article. What do you see who funded this article? You'll be uh, blown away. I said, eight, uh, basically, they covered the paralytic um, outbreaks of polio. And this article, if you see right here, was 2008. It said, quote, uh, the outbreak is likely at a minimum of hundreds of thousands and more like several million individuals were infected during these events. And then many thousands more have been affected by what's called VDP. PV. What is VDPV? Vaccine-derived poliovirus. Many of these countries that are out there, they're no longer vaccinated against the wild virus. They're vaccinating literally against paralytic cases were identified in the eight CVDPV outbreaks. Vaccine-derived poliovirus. And that's something that can go wrong. Where basically the people who become vaccinated become the vectors and who funded this wonderful study right there the bill and melinda gates foundation and now the link to the study so you can reference it on your own now keep in mind very few people experience paralytic polio so you can have a polio outbreak and not a lot of people experience polio to the paralytic side we all have the picture in our mind of the iron lungs so on and so forth that's not common in a lot of the outbreaks, but still, it's a warning, and I want to give you an example of what could happen. Even though this is happens a lot, 
is not well known in the United States. All right, to proceed to the next one, give you an example where the vaccine individual could become the carrier as well. All right, infectious virus in exhaled breath of symptomatic seasonal flu influenza cases from college community. What does that mean? It means this. As we read through, in adjusted models, we observed, quote, 6.3 times more aerosol shedding among cases with vaccination in the current and previous season compared to ha with having no vaccination in those two seasons. So what ends up happening is you can you can shed the virus either through breathing. In this case, they're trying to figure out they went to lung inflammation, so on and so forth. It's a wonderfully detailed study. Not all influenza vaccines were associated with viral shedding. But if not careful, like the researcher said before, you can have things like this where you actually can, how would you say, the words aerosolize. So you're going from one thing from a droplet uh, virus to an aerosolized virus with a much smaller micron, which makes masks, let's just put it this way, not as effective, just to give you a rundown. And I think, was that it? Yep, now let's go to the data analytics. And again, the links to this will be all there for you so you can look on your own, not to be conspiratorial, not being pro-vaccine, anti-vaccine, just being safe vaccine. That makes sense? Let us proceed. Vaccine, a medicine is a medicine. Not all medicines are good, not all medicines are bad. That's the best way to think about it. You don't want to think black and white. All right, now to our data analytics. And we are going to go first. I want to show you the first thing I'm working on, and I will expand on this next week. This is the world mass thing. Now, what happens is I get this information from the Our World and Data, which is maintained by Oxford University. I'm breaking down the columns so I can put this on GitHub for you and merging everything and so on and so forth. And what we're looking at right here is this is what they call facial coverings, not face masks. So every time you see a column up here, that means they're maximized or should say made mandatory everywhere. And these are your countries. Now, as you head down this list, you may be surprised at some of the countries that do not mandate masks as severely. And the rating for this is zero, which you see right there, Syria, Palestine, Venezuela, Solomon Islands, no policy. One, it's recommended, Finland, Estonia, Somalia, Japan, Yemen, Norway. And these are areas where basically, well, Norway, sorry, is a two, where it is required in some shared areas. And where there's really relatively no or low uh, COVID transmission. So again, in order to have us have an, an honest conversation in reference to pandemic mitigation strategies, you need to have controls to work with. And so that's what I want to try to break down. Germany is a two. And let's see, United Arab Emirates as we go up. And yeah, now here's the catch. And here's the correlation. Yes, the places which are using masks and making mask mandates, are they making mask mandates in response to paranoia in reference to COVID-19? Is COVID-19 spurring the need for the mask mandates? And so on and so forth. You could see the correlation is the confounding that goes on. You know, it's the chicken and the egg type strategy. But however, though, many countries, for example, may have a cultural desire to wear masks but even if they're doing better than us, you know, for example, like Germany, Russia, so on and so forth, it is only required in some spaces, but not man mandated in all spaces. Hong Kong, Netherlands, Greenland, I mean, these are all uh, very well-developed countries. Not all, I should say. A lot of them are developed countries. All right, let's proceed to the next one. We are going to go to do, 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 the Scandinavia one. And, you know, this is one of my favorite. I ran all the kernels ahead of time because uh, Python, or I should say, Jupiter Lab was running really slow. I don't want to have you waiting. All right, total case per million. Still, this is up to date. And this is as of mid November. USA is right there. Iceland had a little bit of a peak and it dropped back down. Uh, Sweden had a little bit of a peak. And this is again, just this is deaths per million. I apologize. And then generally dropped. But all these countries, which basically didn't have to have uh, lockdowns as severe as the United States. Again, that's your comparison. All right, here we go. Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway. This is new cases, smooth per million. Cases, again, 
COVID looks like it transmits easier, but the mortality rate seems to have declined dramatically. Some people say it's because it's better treatments, but I'm still seeing the data, which we'll look at in a second. People go into the hospital, they're not coming out at about the same pace, in the United States at least. All right, so here we go. And this could be a possibility for that too. Think of it this way. In the United States, if someone goes into the hospital and gets diagnosed with COVID or COVID-19 or whatever, there's a lot of things that go on where places of employment can be closed, restaurants can be closed, so on and so forth. So there's a possibility in the United States that people are only going to the hospital when they have to, as opposed to being cautious, because the ramifications are so frightening for many individuals in the United States. In the beginning, it was like, all right, okay, let's just check it out. Now it's like all your friends get quarantined. You see where I'm heading? So there's got to be a way to encourage people to come to the hospital before, they, that, before they're really, really sick and spreading the disease as opposed to almost punishing them for getting sick. Well, you, that's, you can see how that can happen. If you're a teenager, you went to a party you weren't supposed to go to, and now you're not feeling well, but you don't want to go to the hospital because you're afraid if you do that, you get your friends in trouble. You see the scenarios, there's many more like that. To proceed, Denmark, Finland, USA, all right, so far and so forth, this case is smooth per million. Yep, again, don't pay attention too much to the cases anymore, and now we want to go down to the hospitalizations and deaths. Deaths smooth per million, look at Iceland. Now again, we're going apples to apples, deaths per million. The United States is still up there. Uh, Sweden, again, I like to follow because Fauci was picking on them at one of the meetings. Uh, Denmark, Norway, still really low, low. Uh, this is the comparison to the United States. All right, what this is now is this is deaths per million. So the United States is about 2.38, I believe. And look at that. That's compared to other countries. That gives you a really good perspective. So the United States is way up there. And that's our breakdown. It's at 2.4 compared to the other countries. That's deaths per million. All right, now to proceed to number two, we're going to look for correlations. Correlations is a global correlations. I'm going to move through this real fast. All right, this is all the countries that broke down. If you want me to post this code on GitHub, just say the word. All right, we're looking at life expectancy. Unfortunately, again, as I said, the United States is in the top 40, but we're going from here. So Japan is the highest life expectancy down to here, where Poland, I believe, is the top 40 around. Yeah, I believe it's the. Yeah, it should be the top 40. All right, where is that tail? Yeah, tail 40. All right, so there it is. Current case mortality. All right, you see where Iceland popped up there? This is as of today. Uh, actually, I should say as of yesterday, 11 14. And so, life expectancy, not a lot of correlation. All right, so now we go down to population density. And here's an irony. Overall case mortality, Singapore, this is, this. remember when I say overall, this is from the beginning of the pandemic onward. Look at that. You see that? That's the highest population densities. And so obviously the United States even, doesn't even reach that. But look at this. United Kingdom's all the way down here and still the highest population density. So we don't have a really strong correlation there. As of today, look at this. You see that? A lot of countries have overcome this pandemic. Some have not, but others have. So that can be much of a call for a vaccine for a disease, which is not, uh, how would you say, relevant any longer in their society. Total cases per million. This is basically just giving a breakdown. Uh, who has the most cases per million? So it's comparing apples to apples. There's the United States between Kuwait and Panama. Even look at that. That's Switzerland, France, Argentina, Peru, Chile. All right. Now deaths per million. Now this can go to medical treatment, so on and so forth. Peru, way in the lead. This as of November 14th, 2020. Argentina, Brazil. Look at South America. Just get, just get ravished. Then United Kingdom and United States. Uh, you know, basically tied. 
Uh, Ecuador is doing better than the United States, Italy, so on and so forth. Even Italy, with all the deaths in the beginning, is still doing better than the United States because it looks like something happened where they overcame it. Again, that's total deaths per million. Uh, deaths per million to total cases per million. You can see right there. It's a little difficult graph to read, so I'm going to pass over it. Uh, deaths per million to cases per million. Again, once again. And there is your information. Now, these are all the countries that are doing better than the United States. All right, so here we go. Uh, da, da, da. Where is that? New deaths per million. What was the United States at? Let's see. He dropped out of there. All right, these are all the countries, for example, that are doing better. Uh, Russia, Brazil, Chile, Germany, Morocco, Azerbaijan, Ecuador, and so on and so forth. But I was looking for one thing. Yeah, it's not showing there. It's not showing there. I don't want to waste your time in reference to it. But I thought it was, let's see if it's right here. This gives you an idea of the graph as well, too. Let's say, did the U.S. go up? Yeah, U.S. is at 3.559. So what I do is right here, you see now I, do the, I just had to go down. I forgot the information, so let's say 3.6. So these are all the countries which are doing better than the United States. So Colombia, Russia, Brazil, all the way down the line. Now keep in mind, as we go forward, and I work on that mass correlation thing. Again, it's correlation. doesn't mean the masks are not completely working or not working at all. It just gives you an idea. These are the countries which are doing better in the world than the United States. Thailand, Madagascar, Senegal, Somalia. Now, again, also, too, to be fair, we have to go by reporting. So I'm going to go through the Human Development Index so we get a good run. Uh, Japan, Venezuela, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Malaysia, Egypt, Sri Lanka, all doing better than the United States, according to the reporting and reference to death smooth. And this is the numerical information as far as you want to find out there. Now, again, Australia is zero, Senegal, Haiti, all because it's zero doesn't mean there aren't deaths. It may not be just recorded. There's your life expectancy, so on and so forth down the line, just to give an idea. All right, and now we're going to go to COVID states. I am going to run through this really fast. All right, here we go. This is all run through. There is California, South Dakota, bouncing up and down all around. But South Dakota, as a mean, is right there. Again, all because it has a low population means it's more vulnerable to spikes up and down. Uh, South Dakota. Now look at this. Positive increase in cases. Look at Florida right here. Remember what Florida said, hey, no more lockdowns? Well, look where Florida is at right now. You make the judgment call. All right, and then death increase per total was run down. Uh, again, you said Florida. Death increase per total, again, Florida's about down there. Positive increase per 100,000. Florida, still orange. California, blue. Uh, New York, green. So look at this. Florida and New York are still pursuing massive lockdowns. I'm not Florida, I apologize. Take that back. California, New York. Florida said, hey, no more lockdowns. Look what happened. Look at the data. Look at the correlation. Now, if there's more that can play, they can be confounding, involved, and so on and so forth in regard to reporting irregularities, because you notice right here, the graph's mean tends to be a little high, or the average. But regardless of that, look at that. Florida is now lower than two other states, which have stringent lockdowns. And if you're in California, like I am, they're trying to cancel Thanksgiving with tra travel restrictions, so on and so forth, where Florida, the state of freedom, look at that. That's that's the numbers. Numbers speak louder than words. So here we go. All right, and now we're going to do, 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 see the mean right there. It's a little higher. Uh, looking at death increase per thousands. Florida's still a little higher, It's but it's now matched, at least as today is, uh, with California. All right, and moving down the figures, 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 do, do, do. This is the total death count from New York down to South Dakota, moved up a little bit. You see, even though total deaths in South Dakota are relatively low, you know, 
That's why the graphs are very dramatic. However, just the same, the population tends to be pretty low. So if it wasn't for these other states here, you probably wouldn't even hear about it on the news. All right, and then we go on right here and we're looking at the positive increases. Texas, boom. Illinois, California. Um, these are the states, but you have some states right here, like, you know, really, really low, if even in the detectable level. I'm um, sure they must have some positive cases, but at least as of today, they didn't report it. And that's it for that one. So let's go to the world data on the COVID. Boom, boom, boom. Once again, new cases smooth per million, new deaths smooth per million, running along that line. All right. Still, same thing. This is the percentage of cases to deaths. A little bit of a rise, but a little bit of a leveling off at the same time. And did you do, going down, down, down. We saw that, saw that reproduction. All right. Remember the all lockdowns and that's been going on, so on and so forth. Great Britain, lockdown, they're blue. Um, USA, I was about to say who USA is. Look at that. They're way up there. Sweden, keep in mind they're not doing anything, but for whatever reason, they are getting more infections. But what's the outcome? This is the outcome. Deaths per million. We have Great Britain, way up there. USA, which is doing quite better than Great Britain as far as treatment is concerned. Sweden, which again, very minor on the pandemic mitigation lockdowns, still showing off to the rest of the world that basically pandemic mitigation can take place without basically having to use prison terminology such as lockdowns, social distancing, masking up. You still could have freedom. And because whatever and the reason I'm using Sweden as an example is because anytime anything ever happens with Sweden, they have a couple of cases or cases go up or down. The media just gravitates to it to say, like, see, I showed you, show you, show you. I told you lockdowns work. You should be doing this and you should be doing that. Well, you know, on the inverse it should be the exact same. If Sweden is successful in what it's doing, regardless of whatever it is, not doing the lockdowns, maybe they're doing better medical treatment, better medical access, so on and so forth. Uh, more personal responsibility in reference to hygiene. Just say, hey, if it's working and people are happy and it's less effort, why not incorporate it? That's why studies require controls. The worst part about what we're doing right here, here I'm ranting, about this whole pandemic mitigation is become emotionally attached to the outcomes. And we are not using other countries as controls as you would conduct any other study. And of course, here we are, look at basically these all on the x-axis here we have japan we have taiwan which is a, taiwan did minor lockdowns look at this um south korea so on and so forth you know basically did i mean they're still right along the x-axis and then we've got this is you know as far as sweden compared to the united states uh death per million they had one death per million they're doing three times better at least in the united states there you are for comparison. And I'm doing this because Fauci pointing it out there in Congress, and I thought that was kind of a, not a highlight of reference to pandemic mitigation strategies. And then, of course, other individuals coming into the new administration that are like stamping their feet like children that want to do the exact same thing that does not appear to be working at all. And keep in mind, i.e., reference back to the one article in regard to endemics how with these MPIs can be making future diseases far worse. And new deaths to Sweden, new deaths to USA, da, da, da. And then we look at the other countries. There we are. Please forgive me for speeding up. And that's lockdown, so on and so forth. And then we go to this. This is the Monte Carlo. Now the Monte Carlo uh, simulation has not veered off too directly it seems to be successful interesting enough the lancet back in march did the exact same thing the monte carlo simulation this is cases as they begin to grow and that's now uh forecasting out to february 17th 2021 new cases prediction they believe the cases will continue to rise the monte carlo prediction based upon uh, past uh exposure or basically past history and then 
again, if you look at the middle line, you still have a decrease. And this, I believe, is do do do. Yeah, so standard deviation. So it could be as low as 2.15, as high as 5.872. And again, this is going global uh, across the. Nope, sorry. Apologize. Take that back. No, that is global. That's going global. All right. And that's what I'm doing there. And then I want to look at one more thing real fast in reference to the COVID data information. We're not going to go through hardships because we. Oh, here we are. And yeah, must have passed over this. All right, this is basically our pair plot looking for correlations between anything, which doesn't seem to be any correlation. Test, you know, test results to death increases if you know how to read pair plots and so on and so forth. And there's your, your this is the United States. This is your positive increases to hospitalization increases. Again, now we're talking about hospital. Now you see a lot of the news going. They they pick they cherry pick these states, but overall, this is the result. This is the data as of November fourteenth. Even though it's two forty six in the morning on November fifteenth, hospitalization increases, death increases. Look at that and learn that very very well. That's why I'm not holding much promise on the appearance of medical treatments being the reason why people are surviving more. All right, this is up to midpoint in the election. And now you begin to see a little bit of decline. But again, every few days you see a decline there. And there's your hospitalization increases, the positive increases. You see that weird part right there, how it all of a sudden skyrocketed? That's amazing. Uh, that's like you would never, I mean, if you were mathematically trying to predict a model in reference to that, all of a sudden, boom, from basically the 16th, 67,940 to 163,473. It could be an indication of more testing, which there appears to be. But again, that's only my hypothesis. Positive increase, once again. Positive to hospitalizations is still declining, no matter what they're saying in the news. That's the data that's showing, still declining. Uh, positive increases to death. What do we have here? We are now at. 0 0.80, 0 0.76. Now, you really can't compare it to influenza because you know why? I discovered just the other day that deaths by influenza are not required to be reported. So without a control or something to compare it to, uh, you know, we could say it's worse than influenza. But if we're not really counting, then how do we know? Even though I, I, I do hear that influenza cases are lower, but I'm talking historically. And but you still you're dropping, and sometimes there's a 0.43. So hopefully, eventually, um, it either antigenic drift and it mutates, and things get happy and beneficial, or we get with better treatments like vitamin D, or melatonin, or vitamin C, or zinc, or even if it's a prescription drug. There's lots of things out there that seem to be having a positive effect. I just haven't seen bureaucrats preach anything more than masks, distancing, hand washing, and lockdowns. I really, they say they listen to science. They listen, yeah, they listen. To, if it was the 1400s, like I said before, like the Dark Ages, yeah, they're listening to science. All right, and basically continue. Here is our basic information there. Do, 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 and you get the point. Again, I'll have links for all the, all the information that's out there in reference to these articles. Just so you can see, again, we covered vitamin C. We covered basically the uh, arthritis drug. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing it correctly, brisitinib. brisitinib. We covered basically the endemic that may pursue due to the social distancing and mask wearing and so on and so forth. We covered the difficulty in diagnosing and how temperature tests and things like that may not be effective because if most people are asymptomatic then how would you ever know so you know mandatory testing i don't know i'm not too crazy about that uh we covered the animal transmission from human to animal and animal to human has now occurred sadly um we covered basically the potential re uh, resistance to the vaccine developing shortly after the vaccine development if certain precautions are not taken taken place 
just a warning that the uh, scientists are trying to say, hey, let's let's learn from our mistakes and let's make this a success. Again, all this information will be linked. Ralph signing off. It is now at 2.50. Thank you for being patient, and I look forward to you all once again. If you want to watch on Tuesday, Tuesday, I think, unless something really good comes up, I will go into depth in reference to the vitamin C and the COVID. Uh, whoops, wrong one, sorry. Because it it is just an incredible, incredible detailed work from these wonderful researchers. Again, signing off, Ralph, gratitude. Thank you very much for being up with me this time in the morning, and I'll see you all next time. Okay, signing off. Bye.